Good evening. Uh, when Charisma was passed out, my guest tonight must have been there with a shopping cart. Uh, when New Faces of 1952 uh, opened on Broadway, uh, one of its most exciting discoveries was the woman who is my guest tonight. That's Leonard Silman's New Faces, by the way. Her name is Eartha Kitt. Uh, right now, Miss Kitt is a new face on Broadway all over again. When this show is broadcast, she will just have opened in the musical Timbuktu, which is a remake of Kismet set in black Africa. And Timbuktu brings her back to the stage for the first time in, well, more than a decade. And in fact, she has been absent from these shores a good bit during the past decade. But I'm delighted that she's here tonight to show us what we've been missing. Will you welcome, please, the inimitable Eartha Kitt. Certainly glad to have one of us back. I'm not sure. Uh, <laughs> Please don't go away so long next time or whatever. I'll do my best. Eartha, I would like to get from you your version, once and for all, of something that happened to you some years back. Uh, but before I get to that, if there was ever a cliche that was true about anybody, there's one that's true about you. And uh, it's rags to riches. Literally, from the dirt farm in South Carolina to what they used to call the smart supper clubs of the world. You don't hear that phrase much anymore. But the shimmering, sexy, glamorous, rich, envied, marvelous woman who sits beside me now. Ow. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I didn't mean you, the one over there. Yeah. <laughs> I was wondering whom you were referring to. <laughs> but uh, could, could you possibly ever have had a pre-sentiment back there in South Carolina, someday I'll show them all, I'll be there and headlining in the Persian room. Well, no. not really that way, of course, I know what you're referring to, but uh, I didn't know anything about the outside world in the cotton fields of South Carolina, so you have nothing to compare anything to. That was the world. That if was the world. If someone had showed you a picture of a, a, a glamorous woman in a red evening gown in front of a microphone, you would not have known whether that was from this planet or something it's true. else, probably. Uh, actually, the people whom we uh, were uh, working for on the plantation, we only saw them also as working people. Mm -hmm. We never saw them in a glamorous way. All we saw was the great big white house sitting in, you know, on top of the hill. And those are the people whom we were working for. And uh, when we saw them, they would come and pick up the cotton, you know, in the big sheets. But that's uh, the only type of life we ever saw. I didn't know anything about electricity or inside sanitation, which still scares the devil out of me or gas stoves, movies, never heard of it, a radio I'd never heard of. As a matter of fact, when my aunt, my mother's sister, sent for me to come here to New York to live with her after my mother died, mm -hmm. and uh, she took me away from the South because I was being very badly treated by the people down there because they said, well, that I don't, we don't want that yellow gal in our house, you know. Yellow gal, now for, just to stop you for a moment, what is, what's so insulting about that phrase? Well it, well, it means you don't belong to anybody, actually. You are not white and you're not black, and. Uh, also being an Ill illegitimate child. Yeah. You're an ugly duckling. Nobody wants you. Your father uh, was white and your mother was black. My mother's, um, my mother was part black and Cherokee Indian. Yeah. So you are, you know, you're But it was your father who was white. Yes, yeah. so I'm told. Yeah. I never saw my father. Yeah. And when my aunt sent for me out of that world and brought me up here to New York, and uh, they turned on the electric light on the wall, I think I stood and played with it. I thought it was magic. As a matter of fact, I still think lights are magical. But as a child who never saw any type of world like that, you know, it was very, very am amazing for me. And then they turned the radio on and voices came out of this box and scared the devil out of me. Yeah. And when I asked what is happening, my aunt said, well, there are little tiny people inside. <laughs> and when you press the button, the people will talk, or you press another button yeah. and they don't know to play music. Are so you telling me there aren't little tiny people? <laughs> <laughs> yes, you. <laughs> Isn't that what we are now? <laughs> I, I never expected to grow up to be one of those little tiny people, did you? <laughs> but all of that was very, very, very interesting. It's fascinating yeah. for a child to be brought out of a world that has nothing to compare to. We didn't have any books. I went to school, I think, two or three days when we were down there. So we had no magazines. 
and mm -hmm. no movies, nothing to compare the rest of the world to. You ever get a kick of the kind that I, I talked to the singer Charlie Pride about on the show once, of being able to go back and stand on that very land and say, I could buy this now if I wanted to? <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever had any desire to get that kind of uh, emotional no, revenge? I want to stay or... as far away from the cotton fields as possible. <laughs> <laughs> In case they reopen them. <laughs> Yes, as a matter of fact, I have a little estate in Beverly Hills, mm -hmm. and I always threaten every agent I've ever come in contact with that I'm planting cotton and I'm hiring them to pick it. <laughs> <laughs> you have a little uh, a little white jockey out front. Who, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, the Iron Man. Yeah, we, I've threatened to do that many times, but uh, yeah. I haven't done it yet. yet. Has anyone ever explained why, if three out of four of your grandparents were white, you're black? But if three out of four of your grandparents were black, you're also black? You know no, what I mean? well, uh, there are all sorts of reasons for that, and we won't go into that, because well, I, that we're all sensitive to that kind of thing. And, but it, the, the point to me is that if you are particularly of all of these bloods, you belong to everybody, and that's the way mm -hmm. I've always felt about myself. And when they say you don't belong to us, and you don't belong to us, and there weren't enough Cherokee Indians left to, to get in contact with, then I felt that since I was so rejected by everybody that... Uh, I had to find my own way to be related to somebody. So I've accepted everybody, and I hope that everybody has accepted me. I don't give a damn about what race calls me their own. Yeah. What if a man... <laughs> well, certainly not yours. <laughs> <laughs> they, they say there has to always be somebody you can be prejudiced against, um, or, or the world will come apart, you know, and it, it seemed that finger seems to move from race to race over the years, um, but not, maybe not fast enough. One of the fascinatingly interesting things to me is uh, Alex Haley, who went back and looked, you know, the roots route Tons. and all of that sort of thing. We found that, uh, and the last thing that he did on, on a Sunday afternoon, I think it was, after, it was after Roots. This was rather recently, it was on television. Mm -hmm. And in that church, in the area in which those people were brought there as slaves, Everyone, the cotton uh, plantation owners and Alex Haley's family are all now so mixed up that nobody knows who belongs to whom and everybody belongs to yeah. everybody, which I thought was absolutely fantastic. The whites and the blacks are all mixed up now. And there's no way in this world you will ever know who your ancestors were specifically uh, on one side. If there's, suppose a man came uh, to the door of somewhere you're working and could prove that he was your father and someone said, there's a man outside who is your father, do you want to say hello to him? Oh, I'd say hello to him. Anybody can be my father. Well, but if you thought he really were, would you tell him a thing or two about how he might have managed to show up a little sooner? No, I don't think so, because I think that uh, I've done all right. Yeah. I've, I, he didn't, I don't want to make anybody feel that they were guilty in, uh, in not doing what you know, was intended to do or should have been done no. by legal-isms and all of that. I, no, God has taken care of me very well, and I'm very happy for that. Good for you. What really did happen that, could you relive quickly and briefly, if you're tired of telling it, uh, that fateful day in Washington when you went to the White House and uh, Lady Bird Johnson invited you, among others, to sit and talk? And well, I got an invitation from uh, Mrs. Johnson that said, why is there so much juvenile delinquency in the streets of America? Now, this was 1968. And it was because of some work that I have been doing and continuously doing, working with underprivileged children in all areas of the world, mm -hmm. in New York and now also with an organization called Kidsville in Los Angeles. And in Washington, when I was there, with the all and the Pussycat, I was involved with a group called Rebels with a Cause who came to my dressing room at the National Theater and asked me to be their spokesman because Washingtonians do not have representatives, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And um, I went around Washington and I saw what they were showing me, the poverty-stricken areas, yeah. areas that had been built in 1937 that hadn't even been paved, and uh, people were living in very squalorly conditions and not even hot water. And um, they showed me what was happening to the poverty money, which was not being used quite properly. Yeah. And we were responsible for getting something like five areas of Washington cleaned up within about two years' time. So when I got the invitation, it was because Hubert Humphrey had referred me to Mrs. Johnson because of the kind of work that I have been doing and also the fact that in each country that I travel into, the boys who had been running away from America because they did not want to be involved in the Vietnamese War because they feel that we should not have been involved in the Vietnamese War would also come to my dressing room and tell me what their feelings were. And uh, when I got the invitation, why there is so much juvenile delinquency in the streets of America, I 
raised my hand because all of the things that were being said to me were not very constructive. This is there in the White House now. Yes. They were saying things like, well, when I see a, a, a little boy about to throw a stone, we walk over to him and tap him on the shoulder and say, you mustn't do that. Or we feel that, these are what women were saying, that we should build bigger street lights so if we are going to be attacked that we can at least see who is attacking us. <laughs> and we should put uh, bigger flower pots on the windows of the ghettos of America. And it was absolutely nonsense to me. Mm. I said, I thought when I raised my hand finally, Mrs. Johnson gave me the floor, and I asked her the question, don't you think we have missed out on something here this afternoon? I thought the question of the day was, why is there so much doing delinquency in the streets of America? Do you think it might not have something to do with our involvement in Vietnam? Because our boys feel that it does not pay to be good. If you are good and be brought up by the Ten Commandments, it is our parents have brought the, the children up. I'm a mother myself. You know the pains of bearing a child. Even though we only have girls, we still bear the pain, and the pain is very rewarding. And then we get to, the children get to an age where they are about to go out on their wings and practice the Ten Commandments. Suddenly some foreign man snatches them away from us and throws them off into a war that says thou shalt kill, thou shalt steal, thou shalt do everything against the Ten Commandments. Don't you think it might have something to do with our involvement in Vietnam? Well, I don't know how long I talked, but suddenly the room became extremely quiet. <laughs> <laughs> no, no more mention of flower pots. No. <laughs> but when I sat down, it was also terribly interesting to me because the lady who was sitting to my right put her hand on my thigh and whispered to me with her head down and this is a free democratic country that we're living in right yeah. we're not supposed to be living in fear of our government but with her head down she whispered to me thank you Eartha for saying what you're saying we would all like to say the same thing but unfortunately most of our husbands work for Mr. Johnson so a lot of those women who were there were not outsiders they were in with Mrs. Johnson. So it was all like a propaganda for Mr. and Mrs. Johnson. It does take a lot of nerve to do what you did, however, whether you planned it ahead of time or it was a spontaneous uh, no, it was not feeling before, of the moment. Uh, clearly happened. it was so the latter. Uh, yeah. uh, but within you, two uh, hours after that luncheon, on my, and it just took until 1975 for me to get this dossier because I didn't even know it until 1975 that I was suddenly cut off from the American public. Yes, your career took a, a conspicuous nosedive at that mm. point, and uh, just to film, a, a dossier was gotten, I believe Seymour Hersh of the Times called you, did he? Yes, or, he did. Uh, or was it the Jack Anderson column, or both, in which you realized the extent to which they had been snooping? Yes. And was it dated after the White House incident? By the dossier says that two hours after the luncheon, President Johnson picked up the telephone and called across the nation networks and said, I do not want to see that woman on the air. You think that's true? It's what's on the dossier. Yeah. And this is CIA and FBI. Was he in the room to see or, this happen? Where he, he was, he hasn't actually no, present. No, it was reported he was. to him. Afterwards. Yeah. He was not. He came in, which was also terribly funny to me, too, because the ladies were sitting around, were looking at the tablecloths and looking under the plates to see <laughs> if they were Limoges or, or Dresden or whatever. And they were very concerned as to whether President Johnson was going to come in and pass out autographs. So you can, you can feel the, the consensus of, of the opinions of the people of that yeah, day. Yeah. And when this man walked in, Dick, he went over to the rostrum that was, for some reason or the other, sitting in the middle of the, of the room that we were having lunch in, put his elbow on the rostrum and said, I want you all to know how wonderful it is for the first family to invite the common people to have lunch with us. Oh, you that are. is the honest truth. Maybe it's a joke that fell flat. Well, it fell awfully flat on me. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I had a chance to get to see some of the material that was in your dossier, but I invited you here anyway, even though you are a sadistic nymphomaniac. <laughs> and, uh, oh. and then <laughs> And the fact that you're shallow, now, I, I thought to be both a sadistic nymphomaniac and shallow at the same time takes a great deal of skill. And if you were, in fact, the talk of Paris, as it says in, your, in the dossier, uh, because they managed to find an informant conveniently who was willing to say some bad things about you, uh, it would have been incredible for you to do the things you did and also perform at night. <laughs> nightclub, so. I think you're Admiral Bull on every level that I can think of. But, um, I think it's also it really unfair for the CIA yeah. to be spending American tax money to find riffraff about us personally that yes, has nothing to do with being subversive. 
can't waste be that money hard, too, to find an informant who wants to spread a little dirt about uh, anybody who's successful in the business and mm -hmm. so on. But uh, sleazy it certainly is. Um, well, I'm glad that's over. I hope you're not... Are you bitter about that, ticked off, that experience, or just somewhere in between? I'm not ticked off and I'm not bitter. I'm disappointed, yes, mm -hmm. that our government has, has fallen down uh, the way they have and had promised the American people so much and have not come through. I'm still sitting here waiting for the 40 acres and a mule. <laughs> <laughs>